I think ghost stories are important because what they really are are history demanding to be remembered. It's the past coming to the present, and it's a way we keep history around, mingle with it, talk about it, discuss it. Uh, sometimes it haunts us for a good reason, like a battle took place or an unsolved murder or, or some event that left a scar not just on the land but on our psyche. The interesting thing about ghost stories is that they do seem to have a lifespan. A few centuries, uh, you know, we don't really talk about the ghosts of Roman soldiers or ancient Egyptians because it's just too far back. We don't feel a personal connection, but certainly civil war, uh, maybe even revolutionary war. So two, three hundred years seems to be about the bulk of the stories. Not to say that there aren't exceptions. There are. But I feel like once we lose a connection with people, once it's just too far removed, we kind of let them go. I don't think a ghost exists without living people because I feel like there has to be a message sender, which is we would call paranormal, and a message recipient, and that's us living people. Even if you're setting up a camera and walk away, you still have a human in that mix somewhere. And so I feel like, you know, in some cases it is some kind of like place memory, but in other cases, sometimes it's deeply personal. Most of the stories I hear about are loved ones, friends, relatives that have passed on that seem to come back with some kind of goodbye message. So when we're talking ghost lore, yeah, we can talk in big strokes about history and, and remembering important events. But when it gets personal, then we're talking about deep love connections. And that is kind of a, a whole other thing. And But you really can't separate them. It's all part of this subject that we call ghosts and haunted places. I've yet to find a town that doesn't have some kind of ghostly legend attached to it somewhere. We've Every community has got its strange spots, the, the particular house that people are afraid of, uh, or some kind of legend that exists only there. And that's one of the things I love about this subject, because we live in a time when our communities are losing their identity, where it's just strip malls and box stores and chain restaurants. But these legends exist only in those towns. And we share them with people we trust. We don't tell just anybody. And that's kind of interesting. We, we're, we're holding on to our identities and our past through some of these legends and ghosts. There are ghosts in every culture. There's a word for it in every language. There are ghosts mentioned in the Bible. When Jesus comes back from the dead, he uses the word ghost twice. He stands before his disciples and says, you look as though you've seen a ghost. I'm not a ghost. I'm flesh and blood. Jesus doesn't say there's no such thing as ghosts. He says, I'm not one. Twice, right in two sentences apart. And I always thought that's interesting. So they've been around forever. The understanding of what they are has been around forever. But we cycle through them because at some point, stories that meant something 600 years ago don't mean as much today. So that's why I kind of feel like there's this, uh, not to say there weren't ghosts, there absolutely were. I just mean, I think collectively we've let them go as we move through the ages and new tragedies and new events take place that that haunt us more than something that we've kind of collectively forgot about on the south shore and in generally southeastern massachusetts we've got the bridgewater triangle which is a rather large area 220 square miles but realistically you could double it the traditional triangle is abington down to freetown over to rehoboth seekonk area um, but you could you could double that. I think you could bring it all the way up to Plymouth. You could bring it down into Rhode Island, into Connecticut. And it's this area, really, where it was a hotbed for the King Philip's War. And since then, we've had so many strange accounts from Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, cult murders, haunted places, you name it. It all seems to be inside the Bridgewater Triangle. And those stories just keep coming up since uh, the documentary came out a few years ago, since we've been talking about it, since it shows up in books more and more people are now coming forward and saying, I've had something weird happen too. So I kind of feel like that story is still being written. I've heard the Daniel Webster estate in Marshfield is haunted. And of course he's buried in Marshfield, one of the great orators of New England history. And um, it makes you wonder, maybe the, the devil wants another round with him. any self-respecting New England cemetery has got ghostly legends attached to it. And while I've often said, why would one haunt a cemetery? That's 
actually rather boring. You know, I mean, if I was a ghost and could go anywhere, I don't think I would stick around my cemetery. I have no connection to it other than that's where my mortal remains are. But when the living go into a cemetery and nearby, you know, that's your ultimate destination. Those bones beneath your feet, that's where you're heading one day. Even if not that specific cemetery, you're going to one of them. And I feel like that little bit of fear opens us up to things that might be around us all the time anyway. It's just we don't think about it when we're grocery shopping. We do think about it when it's getting dark and we're walking through a cemetery and we're tuning in to everything that might be around us. And it gets just a little bit eerie because we sense our own mortality. the chance to ghost hunt in Curry College's admissions building. And it's this beautiful old mansion that's been converted into their offices. And the staff have reported this uh, tall male figure that's been moving around. And in one of the offices, one of the students saw this guy dart by the door. And our assumption was that there was a hallway or a door on this other side. But when we look, it's nothing. It's just a wall. You just kind of scratch your head and go, maybe there's more to it than just a story. said before about the Bridgewater Triangle could easily be doubled, I would bring the point right up to Plymouth because when you had the surrender at Hanawan Rock, those men were promised, you know, first of all, the wampum belt would be returned, the men would be spared, everyone just wanted the bloodshed to stop, then they were marched up to Plymouth. And of course, those promises weren't kept. There, was, there were executions, there were massacres, there were battles. And I feel like that's left this underlying stain. When we teach our kids about the the founding of America. We talk about the pilgrims coming here in 1620. We talk about that first Thanksgiving, how the Native Americans helped those pilgrims get through the winter because they wouldn't have made it otherwise. And then we just leap over decades of history because it's really ugly after that. You, you, the colonists came and really wiped out a giant percentage of the Native Americans, pushed them out through war, uh, diseases, and so on. And we just don't talk about that. But it's here, it's under all of our feet, and I kind of feel like it gnaws at us a little bit. And maybe that's why this area of Massachusetts in particular has so many haunting stories. The message I'd have for people on the South Shore is the same I'd have for anyone. When it comes to the paranormal, ask the questions yourself. Don't jump to any conclusions. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it but your own. If nothing else, appreciate the stories and legends. If you can start there and, and at least ask why do these stick around after all these years, uh, you might find some truth in there. You might find something that resonates inside of you that you can take away and learn from. And I think that's one of the many ways that ghosts and, le ghosts and legends serve us. <laughs>